do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let's pray one more time. Our God, we ask this morning again that you, by and through your spirit, would attest to the truth of this word and burn it in our hearts in such a way that we might be changed and that you might be glorified for Christ's sake. Amen. I imagine that the book of Philippians has more memorable verses in it than maybe any other New Testament book, at least that was the case when I was first converted and told to memorize various scriptures. I was amazed how many of those came from the book of Philippians. You you know them yourselves, I suspect. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A number of memorable verses from one relatively small book. There's one verse in Philippians that I remember uh, vividly because of an experience I had in my family before I was converted to Christ. My older brother had gotten his hands on some Norman Vincent Peel material when he and I were in high school. And uh, for a short time, he was convinced of the power of positive thinking. So he uh, marched into my room uh, one evening and blurted out to me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And uh, being the pagan that I was and uh, not wanting to pass up an opportunity to cross swords with my brother, I blurted out just, in fa- just as emphatically, no, you can't. And my brother, being my brother, uh, he took the bait. Yes, I can, he said. Tell me to do anything. So, uh, so I pointed to my desk chair nearby, and I said, okay, just uh, pick it up. It was a solid oak chair. I said, pick that up. I'll hold it out straight for exactly one minute, and um, I'll time you. And uh, you probably know the rest of the story. Um, Victory again. He he tried it, though. He tried it, and then he put it down, and he marched back into his room and shut his door. With all of these uh, memorable verses uh, in Philippians, sometimes uh, we might overlook the fact that there were deep divisions in this uh, church that was planted the first uh, in what we now call Europe. Uh, Paul writes to them to encourage them to rejoice, but he also writes to them in order to address these divisions in the church and to instruct them on how to resolve them. Uh, Euodia and Syntyche are told to agree in the Lord. The Philippians are encouraged to look out for the dogs, the evildoers, the mutilators of the flesh. There were some, Paul says, who were preaching Christ out of selfish ambition, envy, and rivalry. All of these things affecting the church and its unity. And in order to address these divisions, Paul urges unity. In chapter 1, verses 27, 28, the apostle says this, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with 
one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them, Paul says, of their destruction, but of your salvation. And that, he says, from God. Your manner of life, the word that Paul uses there is uh, akin to our word citizenship. And it's the idea that we are partners in a spiritual kingdom and our lives should reflect that kingdom, not the kingdom of this world. It includes the affirmation, as Paul says in chapter 2, that we are children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? In the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, Paul urging the church toward unity in the gospel. Citizenship in the church, in the kingdom, includes standing firm in one spirit, being of one mind, striving side by side, not each of us doing our own thing. And all of that for the sake of the gospel. Paul says when this happens, the world sees signs of its own destruction. This is, I think, akin to what our Savior himself had in mind when he's praying to his father in John 17, and he's talking to his father, and he prays that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you loved me. That's how important the unity of the church is. It's a testimony of the gospel in the church, and it's a testimony to the world of their own deep divisions and their twistedness and their own perversions. This is why the Lord was concerned about it. This is why the Spirit inspired the apostle in this epistle to be concerned about it. How is unity accomplished in the church of Jesus Christ in the way that Paul's thinking about it here? How do we go about quelling divisions in the church? How do we bring Euodia and Syntyche together? How do we bring Christians together in the church of Jesus Christ? Scripture's answer is profound and simple at the same time in one word, humility. So let's think about it for just a few minutes. First, the mindset of humility, the motivation of humility, and the manner of humility. Again, remember, Paul's concern is that these Philippian Christians, the Lord's concern is that you and I in the church be of one mind, that we work together, strive together side by side. Paul says, complete my joy, we just read it, by being of the same, notice, of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. You see the redundancy over and over again. Unity, one mind, full accord, same love, same mind. And so Paul anticipates, how can this be in the church? And the Spirit says, it's like this. Here's how it works. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count 
others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. There's where unity begins in the church. I don't remember when I first heard the word narcissism or narcissist, but I do know that in my fairly recent experience, it's now become a common term, and maybe that's a product of our political culture. Likely, it's a product of social media. Whatever has produced it, it is now relatively common. You've heard the word, you hear it almost routinely now. There was, however, a fairly groundbreaking book 40 years ago written by Christopher Lash entitled The Culture of Narcissism. And I want you to hear Lash's description of the narcissist, not coming from a Christian perspective, just trying to define what it looks like. And he says this, Notwithstanding his occasional illusions of omnipotence, the narcissist depends on others to validate his self-esteem. I just want that to settle in for a minute. The narcissist depends on others to validate his self-esteem. He goes on. He cannot live without an admiring audience. It contributes to his insecurity, which he cannot overcome, which he can overcome only by seeing his, quote, grandiose self reflected in the attention of others or by attaching himself to those who radiate celebrity, power, and charisma. For the narcissist, Lash says, the world is a mirror. He goes on to discuss narcissism in the context of what he calls our therapeutic culture. And here's what he says. Even when therapists speak of the need for meaning and love, they define love and meaning simply as the fulfillment of the patient's emotional requirements. It hardly occurs to them, he says, nor is there any reason why it should, given the nature of the therapeutic enterprise, to encourage the subject to subordinate his needs and interests to those of others, to someone or some cause or tradition outside himself. He goes on to say, love as self-sacrifice or self-abasement strike the therapeutic sensibility as intolerably oppressive, offensive to common sense, and injurious to personal health and well-being. You see it? The narcissistic, therapeutic personality sees nothing but a mirror in front of him. Everywhere he looks, everything he does, sees himself, herself, as the only object in view. This is what the apostle calls selfish ambition and conceit. And we see this around us, don't we? But there's more, it gets worse. Chuck DeGroat wrote a book entitled, When Narcissism Comes to Church. And there what he's attempting to do is to connect the divisions and abuses that are in so many of our churches to the problem of narcissism. Some of you likely have heard, maybe most of you have heard the little podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. 
It's an eye-opening assessment of the problems that plagued this church in Seattle, Washington from its small beginning to its growth of over 10,000 members and eventually its utter deconstruction. One significant problem in that church was that its pastor appeared to have all the earmarks of a narcissistic personality. When his assistant recommended that he become a little more accountable to other leaders around him, he immediately called a private meeting and charged her with heresy. And others recommended that he make himself accountable to older, wiser church leaders in the broader church. He said that he just couldn't see himself submitting to anyone whose church was smaller than 10,000 people. Selfish ambition and conceit, living life with nothing but a mirror in front of your face. You know people like that? Do you know Christian leaders like that? Are you like that? Am I that way? Paul says that humility is a frame of mind, or in the first place, a mindset. It's not simply an act, nor is it pretense. It requires action. It's not simply a doctrine. Paul says we're to count or consider others as more significant than ourselves. We're to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. Paul's talking here about a disposition and an attitude, not simply a singular thought. The way that Paul uses the word here is fairly unique to Christian literature prior to this usage in scripture the term itself was kind of a pejorative term indicating a kind of groveling or slavish behavior but the Lord sanctifies this word in scripture and the indication here is that we are to have this mindset at the beginning point of our Christianity and our Christian lives. It's interesting, at least uh, to me, that humility in the way Paul discusses it here is not listed as one of the fruits of the Spirit, and it's not given as one of the qualifications of an elder or church leader. Why is that? I think one reason, as one Christian theologian has put it, is that Christian humility is to be seen as the treasure house in which all the other gifts and graces that the Lord gives are meant to be contained. The gifts of the Spirit, the qualifications for leadership in Christ's church, if they're not treasures that are housed in humility, they cannot be adequately lived or affirmed. In other words, if unity is basic to the gospel witness of Christ's church, then humility is basic to the Christian mindset. And it sets, it sets the stage for everything else that is meant to be lived in the Christian life. You know, we give a good bit of attention around here, rightly so, rightly so, to the unifying effect of creeds and confessions in Christ's church. But we should recognize that that kind of unity is only half the story. It's, it, is, it is doctrine that we affirm and which we confess. But if that doctrine which we affirm for the sake of the unity of the church is not housed in humility, unity will suffer inevitably. I want to say that again, if that doctrine that we affirm for the sake of unity, which we must do, is without humility, unity will suffer in Christ's church. We are in danger of deep and destructive divisions 
even among those with the same creeds, if we neglect Christian humility. It's a mindset, a resolution that Christians must make daily. We move from humility as a mindset to the motivation that Paul gives us. One of the means to unity is Christian humility, but that's not the motivation. Unity is the means. The motivation runs much deeper than Christian unity. The motivation for our humility is, as Paul expresses so well here, the mind of Christ. There's no way to give this text. You know enough about this text to know its complexity, its majesty, its mystery, all of those things wrapped up. We can't do that justice here, but I do want to at least point out a couple of things, what Paul says here about Christ and the incarnation. In his commentary on this passage, Moses Silva translates verse 5 this way. He translates it, be so disposed toward one another as is proper for those who are united in Christ Jesus. The point Silva is making is the same point that Dr. Garner was making last week. It's by virtue of our union with Christ that that mind that was in Christ Jesus is ours. And our responsibility is to make it ours, to be who and what we are in Christ. Humility flows out of our union with Christ. That's the first point. The second point I think that Paul is giving us here is that our humility is what it is because of the humility of Christ in the incarnation. Paul gives us in this what some call a Christ hymn. He gives us something of the humble elegance of the mystery of the incarnation. He speaks here, writes here of Christ who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now again, this is uh, impossible for us uh, human beings uh, in, in any way to exhaust or to comprehend these mysterious words, but at least this much seems to be true. The Son of God, in a moment of nothing less than eternal divine humility, said to his heavenly Father that he would humble himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in our likeness. That was his mind set as he is there with the Father in the contemplation of redemption. Now, this is not a case in the incarnation as it is with us of Christ choosing humility instead of selfish ambition or conceit. There's no point at which Christ wrestles with sin in his own heart because there is none. But what it is, is the humility of submission to and dependence on his heavenly Father. It's the humility of agreeing to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which he did not have to do, because he is the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But he determined that he would do that. He submitted himself to his father, he was born under the law in order to fulfill it. In other words, he humbled himself by regarding ruined and repulsive sinners, such as you and me, as more significant than himself. He looked on his enemies who were putrid in his sight and said, I will go. For them, so that I might serve them. 
That's Paul's point. And it's an unbelievable point, except that scripture affirms it. That's what he did. It might help you to contrast this attitude of our Savior with the first Adam, the second Adam, the first Adam. Here's Adam in the garden without sin, made in the image of God. His sole responsibility was to submit himself to God, to live by every word that proceeded from the Lord's mouth. And what tripped him up? Unlike our Savior, Adam determined in his own mind that equality with God was something to be grasped. He was already the image of God, sinless in his created status. He wanted more. Satan tempted him and he literally bit He counted equality with God something to be grasped, and so he ate. Adam was the first narcissist. When the temptation came, all he could see in front of him was a mirror. He said, I want to be like God. It's not enough. that He's made me in his image. He was tempted by grandiose thoughts of himself. And in that temptation, he refused to actually be the image that he was created to be. Instead of taking the form of a servant, Adam took the form of the serpent. My responsibility, your responsibility, is to have the same mind in you that is yours already in Christ Jesus. Lastly, briefly, the manner of humility. What does humility look like in the church? We don't want to skip over the mindset and move directly to the manner. Once we have the mindset, the manner looks like self-sacrifice. It looks like the second Adam. It looks like considering others more significant than yourselves. It does not mean we lay aside our doctrine, those precious truths that the Lord has given to us in his word. What it does mean is that we become reluctant to make our opinions and prerogatives points of division in the body of Christ. It means that we stand firm, as Paul says, of course we do, but that like our Savior, in standing firm, we also look to the interests of others and regard those interests as more significant than ours. Simple, right? Nope. Ask yourself, How have I done, how has my church done through this pandemic? Have we looked to the interests of others? Or have we fabricated biblical reasons to stand our ground on masks and vaccines, no matter what the authorities say? question of humility. If the church of Jesus Christ can't get past masks and vaccines, then Christian humility is at a very low point. The first act of Christian humility is to drop the mirror and to see others as more significant than yourselves. There's another enigmatic passage, there are a number of them, and another one in the life of Jacob. Do you remember it? Genesis 32, Genesis 32, verses 24, 25, and verse 30 says this, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him 
until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So Jacob called the name of that place Peniel saying, I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. This man whom Jacob eventually recognizes to be God, who most in the history of the church have recognized to be the second person of the Trinity, comes to Jacob temporarily in the form of a man and takes the form of a servant because he allows Jacob to prevail over him as the Lord and Jacob wrestle there in that place. But then what happens? The Lord touches Jacob's hip so that it's put out of joint. And then we're told after Jacob recognizes that he's seen God face to face, Genesis 20, 32, 31 says, the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Jacob needed to recognize that he did not prevail because he was so mighty. He prevailed because the Lord came as a servant in that place. I heard someone say recently, the church of Jesus Christ needs more leaders who, like Jacob, walk with a limp. Humility in Christian living, humility in Christian leadership. Christian unity in the church requires, as a prerequisite, Christian humility. Christian life requires humility as a treasure house for every other gift and grace that God sees fit to bestow on us. And Christian humility in the church requires that we drop the mirror and like our Savior, look outside ourselves to the interests of others. Here's your resolution for today and the rest of your lives. Have this mind in you, which is yours now in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, when we read these words and consider your Son, we recognize again that we are insufficient for the task that you have laid before us. And so we plead again for your enabling grace that we might even today begin again to learn to count the interests of others as more significant than ours so that our churches might be one, that we might strive side by side, that the world would know that Christ has come. Bless us to that end, we pray, for his sake. Amen.